this webinar, it will give you the opportunity to learn a little more about containers if you're not familiar, if not to revisit containers, but also to learn more about Kubernetes. <coughs> first things first, uh, my name is Frederic Harper. You can call me Fred. I am a senior developer advocate at DigitalOcean. And yes, as you can see on my picture, I love our lovely mascot, which is a shark, and his name is Sammy. So I'm giving some Sammy love right now in that pictures. During the webinar, uh, there is a question uh, section in the webinar too where you can ask questions. Most of you already uh, use the tool to just say welcome and where you're from. And I encourage you to do that uh, during the webinar. Ryan will answer your question because I'm going to talk and I'm going to show you stuff. But you don't have to answer your questions right now if you don't want to share your question with everyone. If you don't have any question right now and you're just listening, this is perfect. Um, feel free to, if you have any more questions after, or again, if you didn't want to share your question publicly, feel free to ping me on Twitter. I'm a huge uh, fan of Twitter. I use Twitter maybe too much. Uh, you can see me, you can talk to me, you can follow me at Hef Harper on Twitter. Uh, feel free to uh, connect with me on LinkedIn also. Uh, you can see my full name, Frederick Harper. I will be more than happy to connect with you. You can also ask me questions there. And if for those of you that are uh, a little bit like me, I'm a little bit old style, I love my good old email, uh, feel free to send me an email at fred at do.co. And what I want to add to that is that I'm welcoming questions that are not just about the webinar today. So if you are using DigitalOcean, if you're planning to use DigitalOcean and you have any questions, any issues, any problems, or you just want to tell me that the service is awesome, please uh, send me an email. But I also welcome any other technical issues you're having. Even if you're not using DigitalOcean, my job as a developer advocate is to give love to developer. And this is what I do today with the webinar, but this is also what I want to do by trying to help you being successful no matter what's the definition of being successful. And obviously, I don't have the answers to everything, but um, this is the power of working at DO. I work with a lot of super friendly and really brilliant people. Uh, so I can probably find someone who can, who can help me answer the question if I don't have the, uh, the answer. Also, a small warning, I, I'm pretty sure you probably won't hear it that much with my mic, but I have a coughing issue right now, so you may hear me cough once in a while. I hope that's not going to be too loud. I tried to do this away from the mic, and I have a pretty good mic, so it shouldn't be too hard, but I still want to apologize because this is not a kind of experience that I usually want to give to people. <coughs> Speaking of which, I just cough, so I hope it's not that bad. Um, Last note, I cannot see the question right now because I'm going to focus on the slides I have. I'm going to focus on the demo. But as I said, Ryan will answer questions uh, during the talk and I will follow up. I will have some time for questions at the end. So I hope you're going to have a good time. Uh, the webinar goes today. There is many goals. Uh, it was promoted as a workshop, but in the web webinar formats, it's a little bit harder to do it uh, as a workshop and everybody uh, needed to have like a DigitalOcean account to uh, be able to follow up or at least using tools like Minikube or any other provider. And um, that's a little bit of struggle to do this online. So today we're gonna take an approach where that's gonna be mostly like a talk, like a usual webinar. But if you already have uh, things set up, uh, we should have sent the instruction by email, you can follow up with me. And if not, we are recording that webinar. So that's gonna be available on YouTube after. And as I said, I will be more than happy to answer your question after if you try to follow up the steps that I will show you right now, or even better if you want to go even more further. So today's goals, uh, I want to revisit a little bit the trends when it comes to app design and deployment, but we won't spend too much time about it. It's just to set a foundation in terms of like knowledge that uh, we should all have about have design to move to the next step where we're going to get familiar with containers. Again, uh, you may use containers right now. You may know what they are. Uh, I just want to do a quick uh, to revisit containers and be sure that we are familiar enough so we can go 
to uh, the next step after, which is going to be about Kubernetes. But right before, I'm going to build a Docker container image from a demo Flask app. If you're wondering what is Flask, it's a framework for Python. If you're like, oh my God, Fred, I don't do Python. I don't like Python. No worries. It's a hell world application. The application right now does not matter. It's just because we needed someone, uh, something to deploy to do the demo with Docker, but also do a demo with Kubernetes. So don't worry about that. I'm not a Python expert. Uh, I just thought that it was nice to use Python for those demos. One of the biggest part of that webinar is that we're going to learn about Kubernetes architectures and objects. And this is the time where you're going to be like, Fred, oh my God, that is some like knowledge bound. And the thing is that part of it, and I will tell you how, and I will tell you why, uh, you don't need to remember everything, but it's nice. It's kind of like nice thing to know when it comes to how Kubernetes is working. But where we're going to have a much more fun is to see how we can use those objects to being able to deploy what we need to deploy, to deploy your application in the cloud and be sure that we get the most out of it. So as example, I'm going to create an access to Kubernetes cluster. So I'm going to show you how I'm going to deploy a Flask app to my Kubernetes cluster. And by the end, if everything goes well and I don't screw up anything, we're going to have a load balance Flask application. So my goal, so, so those are kind of like sub goal, but my end goal with this webinar is for you to have at least two things. So I want you to get out from that webinar with a better idea of what is Kubernetes and how it can be useful for you. But I also want you to get excited just enough about Kubernetes so you want to try it. And if you want to try it on DigitalOcean, fine. I'm, I'm the first one who's going to be happy. But the, the beautiful thing with Kubernetes is that it's available everywhere and anywhere. But obviously, uh, that was supposed to be a, a kind of like secret-ish. Uh, but someone already asked the question in the follow-up email. So we're going to send you a follow-up email after the webinar. We're also going to give uh, free credits for new uh, DigitalOcean users. So if you want to try Kubernetes or actually anything else also, you're going to be able to do it with some free credits. So isn't that a good way to start a, a Thursday or finish a Thursday for some of you? I think it is. So let's jump in the content right now. Let's talk about HAP modernization and microservices. For those of you that are building application for a long time, uh, you, are, you know what's the monolith approach. And it's, it was probably the only way uh, that we're using to build applications. So I've, I've been in the tech industry for, I don't know, 17 years now. Yes, I am that whole, please don't say it. Uh, and you know, that was kind of like the only way we were building stuff. Uh, we did not even have the cloud. And I'm not saying this to say like, oh my God, it was so hard in our time. Like when I started, when I was younger, kids, that was really hard for me. <laughs> no, that is not the goal. But the thing is that even today, there's a lot of companies and startups that are building their application in monolith fashion. And that's a way to do it. But if you look at the graphic to the right, so I have my application right now. It's an example. We call it Snappy because, hey, Snappy is a good name for an application. And if you look to the right, uh, this application actually is, is the equivalent of um, Flickr, or uh, maybe even 500 pixels, you know, like those kind of websites that let you manage and share your images. So our architectures to the right, our main application is consistent, like consists of one piece that is the front end where there's a web UI, but there's also an API to communicate with the business logic. We have two big chunk when it comes to the business logic. We have photo management and we have user management and we have the database adapter, which can connect like it's a database adapter, it will connect to your database. So the thing with that type of architecture is that if only one piece of logic, let's say the photo management part, because I assume, I never built that kind of application, I used them in the past, but I assume that photo management will probably be the part of my application will be used a lot more uh, instead of like just user management, because there's probably a lot more user creating or adding their pictures, editing their pictures, deleting, uh, sharing in different fashion. So it's probably the part of my application where I would call that part probably one of the bottleneck. So if that part is overload, the monolith 
might still be scale, but it will be scale as a whole, uh, which means that you're probably going to need to provide provision a uh, more full virtual machine to run that monolith application. It's a slow and, and bloated approach. Uh, it's a little more difficult to release. Uh, it's a little more tedious to release, and it's error prone because every time you deploy your application, you deploy a full application that contains all the part that you see to the right. Uh, overall, it's, it's not an efficient use of physical resources. And you know what? What I've seen in the past, when I was building those kind of application, and what happened if one part of your apps doesn't work anymore? Let's say that someone did a mistake and changed uh, some configuration when it comes to the database adapter, and they're all using the same database layer. Uh, even people that want to go for photo for, to manage their picture or manage uh, the uh, users won't have uh, access to the database. So that will cause an issue. Your apps will be doomed uh, instead of like a different approach where you could probably save part of your application or have a part of your application that will work well. <coughs> so there is a way to break the monolith approach. Um, there is that approach called microservices or that microservice approach. Um, as you can see to the left, this is the same application that we have right now, but the difference is that we split our architectures in quote unquote three parts. So we have, again, we still have the front end, the web UI part where uh, we also have a REST API to connect with different part of the business logic, but we also have the photo management and the user management and each their own microservice. And if you look at it, now we have probably three virtual machine running the photo management and only two running the user management. Because as I said before, I suppose it's probably the place where it's getting a lot more overload. So each of those parts can be scaled separately. Uh, it's allowing more flexibility and, and really it's a more efficient way to use resources. And why is this relevant to containers and Kubernetes? It's just because the microservices have designed, it lends itself very and especially well to Kubernetes. Uh, and Kubernetes, you know, has built-in abstraction that have parallels to this design pattern. So if you look at the right, we have the same application, but now we have things that we've never seen before, like pod and node which are uh, objects that are part of, Kubernetes, of a Kubernetes cluster. So we'll deep dive on those later, but this is why I wanted to introduce those kind of like way to do application design because they are the foundation of what we want to think about when we're creating an architecture for application that we will deploy using containers and using a, a cluster like Kubernetes. So let's start by uh, revisit, revisiting containers. I don't know why I always struggle with that word. <laughs> so um, what is a container exactly? And maybe I should start about, I should start about what is a virtual machine. Uh, if you look at the left, you have uh, basically the architecture of what is uh, uh, like how virtual machines are running. As an example, on DigitalOcean, we have what we call the droplets. They're a virtual machine. And that allows you to run multiple full system on a single physical host um, to make this happen. Like as you see on the left uh, diagram, we have the infrastructure, which is basically our physical machine or physical web server. And we have something called the hypervisor. And the hypervisor's job is to manage the multiple running machines and also being able to share the hardware resources between them, which means that within one physical machine, I can run multiple virtual machine, multiple virtual computer, if I can say. And that allows us for like also application sandboxing and versioning. And this is a way, like a more efficient way than uh, running several physical hosts. But it's still a little bit bloated, you know, because if you look at the diagram, there is the full OS that is part of a virtual machine. So again, it's a, it's a good start. It's a good way to do it compared to just having physical machine running everything at the OS level. Now we're running at the hypervisor level, at the infrastructure, and we have those virtual machines. But the containers bring me something a little more. So they're kind of like virtual machine, but also they provide a consistent and reproducible uh, runtime environment much more efficiently. 
So if you look to the graphic to the right, uh, you still have the infrastructure. Obviously, I still have a physical computer to run uh, containers. But the difference is that the operating system will be at the level of the infrastructure. We will have the host operating system. And on top of that, we will have the container runtime. And the container runtime is what will make me, what will uh, give me the possibility to run those containers, to take, to make those containers alive. So within my container, uh, I don't need the full OS. I just need a container runtime that will run those. As an example, you probably heard about it or you probably used it. Docker uh, is, is the one that came to mind when we were thinking about container. So because we don't need the full OS within the containers, uh, the container image files are much more smaller than the virtual machine. So you can still get an image from the virtual machine. You can share them. And this is what we used to do before container. But now with container, because the files are way smaller, it gave us, it gave us the opportunity to spin, spin up uh, much quickly. So usually uh, the time is uh, to spin up a container is way faster than uh, spinning up and, and, and starting a virtual machine. It's usually more performance also. The performance is, is way better. And you know, like virtual machine, uh, we used to have a repository for virtual machine where you can install a pre-built or a pre-configured virtual machine or a snapshot or backup of virtual machine. We have the equivalent with containers where there is pre-configured images available for you to use. And I will show you one that I'm gonna use for my demo, but you can find containers for everything and anything today, uh, which is like you want a container that only run Nginx or, or container that already have Python. Uh, so you can deploy your application without having to manage the, the library and the framework you need to use or Node.js or even WordPress. Everything is mostly available and you can use them as starting point. So there is a full ecosystem and it may seem complex right now on my slide, but it's basically uh, around four items. So the container images and an images is a package of software, uh, an application with all the dependencies and libraries and everything you need to run your application. Um, if I take the Docker ecosystem as an example, you define and you create those using the Docker file. So if you look, to uh, the right a little bit. The first part of the uh, drawing is a Docker file. So I will show you a Docker file letter and I will explain a little more how it's working. But this is how I define my uh, container. So those are the image. And a container is basically a running image. So that image will become a container at runtime. But what gives me the opportunity to uh, take those, actually their text file, uh, there are text file where I put everything I need to be able to run my container. So there is a runtime that allows you to run those containers on the host. On the host. Uh, you can do this on your own computer. You can do this on uh, the cloud also. It's usually also um, give you the opportunity. It actually give you the opportunity to build images or to push or pull them and do different action. Uh, the most popular, as I said, is Docker, but it's not the only one. So you have choices out there. There is Cry.io, uh, there is Containerd and the most popular, but there is also other opportunities and other different technologies that you can use when it comes to uh, container. And lastly, which is the part that is exciting to me because I firmly believe that we should not reinvent the wheel. The, wheel. Um, the benefit of, of having that ecosystem is that there is also a registries. Uh, a registry and there is like actually there is multiple registries but one of the most known is docker hub where uh it's think about this as a github repo for images if i can say so there is a way for you to get images on the docker hub to create your container uh, take those as foundation but also there's a way for you to use the image registry to manage your own uh, container depending on what you want to do so here Finally, the Flask app, finally some code for developer in the room. Uh, you don't have to understand that code. What you need to understand is that it's a hell world. So anybody that's gonna call my application, that's gonna go to the root of my application will get hello world in return. So we import uh, the Flask framework and Flask is, is it's a lightweight, how do you call this? The WSGI, <laughs> so it's a, uh, web server gateway interface. 
so it's basically like like it's I, I just give you the big words but it's basically a web application framework for Python it just make my life easier to do some routing and in my case it's really simple it's just a hello world so now I want to take that application and containerize that flask application so I told you before I'm going to use docker right now let me show, yeah, Docker is started on my computer. So I have Docker installed on my uh, Mac OS machine, but you can install this on Windows and Linux, and, and, and it's available on most, on all platform, I would say. To do that, you need something called Docker file. I was talking before, and if you look to the left, so I have that Docker file already built for me. Uh, I prepared this for a talk. Actually, a colleague prepared this for the talk. I just told the idea. But what I'm doing right now, there is those kind of like instruction where I'm saying, okay, I want to start my container based on the Python 3 because, you know, Python 2 is quote unquote dead now, or actually there's no official support or something like that. And I'm going to use the one with Alpine, which is a really minimal Linux distribution. So I'm going to base my container on that image. I'm saying uh, when you start, when you do the comments, like the work there, where I want the application to work is on the slash app. And I will show you why, because I, this is the structure I have for my application right now. For those of you that are uh, expert or actually that use Python, you will recognize that requirements.txt. So requirements.txt is the equivalent of uh, what you do with package.json in Node, or uh, what you do with, I guess, Cargo and Go. Like there's equivalent for all languages out there, mostly all languages. And it's just a list of what I need to run my application, the libraries and framework that I'm using. So in my case, it's only about Flask <coughs> because I just do a, a simple LOL. What I want the Docker image to do at runtime when I'm gonna build that image and, and, and run it is that I want to pip install, which is like the equivalent of npm install. So that's just gonna install what is what is in, in my requirements text. I want to copy my file into the container. And the important part, if I want to access my application, I want to expose a port from my application. And I decided that that's gonna be 5,000 for my port. Lastly, but not least, when I start my container, I want uh, Docker, the runtime to, to run, uh, to execute Python with the file app.pi. So if I go in my command line right now, let me go to right folder, getting started with containers. So this is available in a GitHub repository, that example. And we also have step-by-step -step all the presentation that I'm doing right now. So if you want to do it again at home, you will all get those resources in the follow-up email we will send you. So first thing I want to do, I want to build my image, uh, build my container based on my image that I define. So I will call this uh, Flask V0 because this is my first one. And uh, let's do this. I'm going to build in images and I did something wrong. Docker build slash D. Oh, what's happening? Do, 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 do. Able to evaluate the Docker full path. Uh, I'm not in the right place. This is exactly why it's not working. You know what? It's always happened. You practice those email, there's always a little something. So I did not have my Docker file. So this is my main folder for my application in my app folder. If you check out my Docker file, and if I open the Docker file, this is exactly what I shown you. So if I do that again, and I will run that comment again, Docker file, and now, ta-da, it is working. So it can take a little bit of time at the beginning because right now what's happening is that Docker will go get the uh, image that I uh, asked, the Python 3 with Alpine, and it will do the pip requirements and it will build that image. So right now I build my image. So if I do Docker images, which is a comment to list all the images I have on my computer, I cleaned them for the demo. So now I only have the Python one, the Alpine one that I asked, and I have the Flask application, which I tagged V0 because this is my beta version of my application. So my images are there. Now what I want to do, I want to run my application. So I can do Docker run, but there is a little tricky thing. I need to specify a port uh, that I want to connect with within my application, but also a port that I want to connect on local OS, and I'm gonna say, I want to run Flask 
v0. So what I'm going to do that now Docker, the runtime will fire up the image that it created. So if I go and I do Docker PS, now you're going to see that my Docker container is running for a big seven seconds. I was really fast because I created nine, I created it nine seconds ago. And now if I want to try my application and remember it's a hello world application, I can use the good old curl and I can do local hosts. Uh, and I always do local host. I should really put a shortcut for that. When I do curl local host 5,000, I have hello world. Isn't that amazing? So this is basically what I've been able to do right now is to, based on my Docker file, I created a container that was running my Python, that they're still running my Python application. Now I'm gonna like kill it and stop it. So now I'm stopping uh, to run my Docker application. So now it's not running anymore, but I was able with a simple text file to deploy everything without having to play with, oh, I need to install the right version of Python on my computer, and I need to be sure that I have the right OS, and I have all the, I need to run pip install myself and do all those things myself. So using Docker is really an easier way to do that. So now I don't need Docker anymore because we're gonna move to something else. I'm gonna close Docker, still taking some resources on my computer. Let's go back to, the presentation. So now I use Docker. Awesome. Good job, Fred. You know how to use Docker. But what's next? What about if I want to have 10 of those or one of those or 1000 of those containers? And you may not be at that stage with your company or your startups or the project you're working on, but it's still something to think about. <clears throat> so how can you deploy and scale and restart and manage all of these containers like you don't want to manage all that. And this is where the magic happens with container clusters. Um, we can talk about Mesos. Uh, there is Docker Swarm. So Docker has a container cluster, a management tool called Docker Swarm. Uh, Docker Swarm is, is usually a first step sometimes because it's offer a simple solution that is really quick to get started with. But there is also Kubernetes, which is like the main topic of today. And Kubernetes supports, uh, I would say Kubernetes is one of the preferred and one of the most popular out there because it supports higher demands and with more complexity. So it's, as I show you, as I will show you today, there is a way for you to start with Kubernetes in a hazy fashion. You don't need to understand everything and anything or go the extra mile and, and go use all the complexity that Kubernetes can give you but there is a way for you to start easily. So what problem do they solve? The thing is that, again, all those management and everything about, it's really everything about managing your clusters of containers. So you're gonna get some metrics, uh, Kubernetes will do some help checks for you. Uh, that's gonna be more secure and there is a way for you to manage the security. There is still the abstraction of hardware, uh, even at the cloud uh, provider level, we're gonna have help with networking, scheduling, you know how to read, it's on the slide. That can help you for a lot of things. So exactly what is Kubernetes? Uh, for those of you that, that are like on social media and you've seen things, you've probably seen like K8S quite often. This is how the cool kids are talking about Kubernetes. Uh, actually, it's just like, because I guess developers were a little bit lazy. Uh, you've seen that if you're part of, like, if you, you're into accessibility with A11Y. But uh, KRS is basically, it's Kubernetes. If you look at Kubernetes, how many letters is there between the K and the S? Yes, you said it, or I guess you said it because I cannot hear you. You said eight and you are right. So it's basically the first letter, the last letter and the number of letters in between. So it's why it's just uh, a lazy way to write Kubernetes and I'm guilty as charged because I use this all the time. You know what? I want to be part of the cool kids. <laughs> so how did Kubernetes start it? Uh, it's, it's from Google. So there's a small group of developers at Google that wanted to create an open source tool for container orchestra orchestration. I don't know why I struggle with that word. Orchestration. Now that was good. <laughs> uh, so yeah, and they were already using something at Google internally called Borg. So what they did is they wanted to make Borg 
evolve, but also release it and open, open source it. So uh, it's a project that was started by Google. They made it open source uh, in 2014. And if I'm not wrong, they released the first stable V1 uh, in 2015, so about a year after. But the thing is that it grew up in popularity uh, because, you know, it's open source, so um, the velocity really around that project increased the day that, again, they decided to make it open source. And that was one of a kind in those terms of projects. So right now, uh, it's really the most popular container cluster out there and most cloud platform, if it's not all, I don't want to say that statement, but like most cloud platforms have some sort of managed Kubernetes offering like we have at DigitalOcean. Uh, it's, it's quite well maintained. Uh, there is regular release, there is new feature added uh, like quite often, and there is a, a good bunch of great people working in a project. I, I just learned recently that my manager Eddie, Eddie is, is part of like is working on a CLI tool right now. So I just love it that uh, they're open and they're really, uh, you know, it's they're part of the cloud native uh, computing foundation, uh, which is part of, uh, of the Linux foundation. So, you know, it's a nonprofit. So it's not Google running the project. It's open source. It's out there. It's under the umbrella of the cloud native foundation. And they're running projects that are quite popular. So not just Kubernetes, but you know, um, they own it and, and like like run Prometheus and Fluendi and many other projects. They're also running a conference out there, uh, many conferences. So uh, check a look, like give a look at Cloud Native Computing Foundation if you don't know them. Uh, it's a great organization. So now this is the part that will blow your mind. Uh, this is the part where you usually don't know all the nitty gritty behind how Kubernetes is working because this is usually the thing that is hidden from you when you're using a services, uh, a Kubernetes as a service in cloud provider because this is the part that is a little more complex, but this is also where the magic happens. So I think it's interesting. It's good to know how it's working under the hood, but please don't uh, don't go crazy about the fact that you may not remember everything. It's fine. Uh, it's just good to know and having some basic. So the architecture of how Kubernetes is working is split into uh, into two um, two things. So there's a client server approach. The server is the control plan. We call it the control plan, and there is clients uh, with a has. And there are nodes uh, which communicate with and receive instruction from the control plan. So let's deep dive a little more in the control plan. Control plan is a bunch of things making like just Kubernetes happen. So uh, one of the first and, and probably like, I don't want to make a statement here, but I would say the most important is the API server. Uh, it's essentially the front end for Kubernetes. It performs uh, all API operations. It communicates with Node through Kubelet. Never know how to say Kubelet, so I'm going to say Kubelet, and I, I guess it just sounds right. Uh, there is the uh, scheduler, which decides where to run pods. Uh, so the scheduler is, is scheduling <laughs> them to uh, worker nodes based on resources availability and other constraint uh, that the system has or that you can set. There's also the controllers. Uh, think of these as uh, loops that maintain uh, that maintain a desired cluster state. Uh, cloud controllers manage cloud provider resources like load balancer, virtual machine, and block storage. But there is also Cube controller that manage Kubernetes resources like groups of pods and and endpoints like services. And lastly, but not last, uh, or at least, there is ETCD, which is uh, basically the persistent data store for Kubernetes cluster data. So together, all these together, these form the control plan uh, that manage the operation of Kubernetes cluster. And, and usually, as I said before, in managed offering, like we have uh, Docs, DOKS, uh, DigitalOcean Kubernetes as a service we're offering. Um, you have access to the Kubernetes API, so it is exposed because this is how you communicate with Kubernetes. But all these other components are typically hidden and usually cannot be customized or modified. So it's why I said it's good to know that they are there because you know when you use a technology, you want to at least understand a little bit how it's working behind the hood. You don't want to use black magic with those things. So you want to understand a little bit how it's working behind the hood. 
but you don't have to memorize everything or know everything about that. This is my way of thinking. Many, many other, maybe other people will tell you otherwise, but this is how I see uh, how it should go. The second part of it, the clients, um, the nodes, what we call the nodes. So there is the Kubelet. <laughs> it's an agent process that manages containers running on node. Uh, it also communicates with the control plan API server and receive pod spec, pod spec, sorry. Don't know why I always say po, pod instead of pod. Uh, it manifests like the, the, the pod spec. Uh, those are manifests uh, that are describing containers that should run on the node. And, you know, uh, Kubelet uh, also start and stop these containers. Um, there's the Kube proxy. Uh, it's a network proxy that runs on each node. It's managing and maintaining network rules and Halloween communication to containers and pods on the node. So this is also an important part on the client, on the client side. There's the C advisor. Uh, it's basically container metrics and the container runtime, which is why a little bit we talk about container before. It is a software that allows you uh, that allows Kubernetes to run containers on nodes. So typically, uh, what the most popular is Docker. So most of the provider out there, as far as I know, are using Docker as their container runtime. So this is all like everything is working behind the hood, but this is not what you're gonna use to make things happen. But first thing first, if I want to interact with Kubernetes, as I said, you get access. In my case, I'm gonna use the DigitalOcean Kubernetes uh, as a service offer. So I create a cluster on DigitalOcean and how I can interact with that cluster. Obviously there is the REST API. So this is the part where I said, this is the visible part where you can interact with. So I can use the good old curl. I can use like there's client libraries for any programming language out there that will make you uh, play with Kubernetes and, and, and interact with Kubernetes. But I would say the most popular, and maybe I say that because this is the preferred uh, way for me to interact with my cluster is the common line tool. I'm a big fan of the terminal. I'm a big fan of the keyboard instead of mouse. Even if I really love your dashboard at DigitalOcean, I'm a big fan of the common line tool. So, you know, command line tools, most of the times they're just way too abstract REST API. So it provides you a full list of comments. And I just think it's, it's more cleaner when I'm using the common line. So what I want to do right now, I want to kind of like, quote unquote, connect my computer to my cluster. I want to set my uh, current context of my computer to my actual Kubernetes cluster. So if I go, uh, let me go back to my browser, getting started with Kubernetes. And if I do, 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 get out of full screen, I will see here I have uh, a cluster that I created. So I have, I created with three nodes. I'm gonna explain a little more what those are. And if I look at the overview, so this is my cluster capacity. But what I want to do right now, I want to be able to connect to that cluster. So I'm gonna download the config file. What I would have been able to do also is use at DigitalOcean, we have our DOCTL, which is our DigitalOcean common line interface or common line tool. And I, I would have been able to authentic, authenticate uh, to my cluster using that tool. But because I want to stay a little more agnostic, I'm going to go with the good old fashion where I'm down, downloading the YAML file. If I look at the YAML file, you're going to see, actually, I won't show you the details of the YAML file because there's token and everything that give me access to my cluster. I don't want you people to <laughs> connect to my cluster like this. So what I'm going to do at that point, let me just close that and let's go back here to be sure things going to work. Uh, where's my note? So, Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy here. Let me put it full screen again. The pleasure of doing webinars. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to copy my file that I just downloaded, which is basically uh, what I need to access my Kubernetes. So I'm going to, let's call, I think, getting started. There we go. It's a YAML file. You know, YAML is everywhere. And I'm going to copy this to a folder on my home called 
yeah, for those of you, the tilde is uh, routine to users slash fr per, which is my own on my macOS machine. It's the same thing as Linux. And I think you have something equivalent in Windows right now with uh, all the new power tools or when they added the Linux bash system or whatever. Sorry about that. Um, I didn't use Windows since forever. So if you don't have the .q folder, uh, you can just create it. Uh, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to copy this to my cube config file. And there is one thing you can see right now. Uh, it's because I'm using a special uh, shell within a uh, term. And you can see that now it's showing my context. Actually, some of you may have noticed there's things about Git in that folder. There's things about the Python version used for my application actually on my system. And now there is that context here. But this is because I'm using a special, a special shell. So if you don't have that shell, what you can do to be sure that uh, you now have the cluster information. You can use kubectl, again, as the common line, is the official, the uh, common line tool for uh, Kubernetes. So kubectl cluster-info, and that's going to list my information on my cluster. So now, as you can see, it's pointing on digital, sorry, it's pointing on digital ocean. So now, at that point, I will be able to uh, do what I want with the cluster. So now I've covered, I've covered how Kubernetes is implementing and uh, design, but now I want to deep dive a little more in the abstraction it provides to let you run your application. So now that is the fun part. So there is a thing called pods, uh, a pod. Actually, a pod is the fundamental work unit or workload in a Kubernetes cluster. It is different from a container as the pod can run multiple containers. Uh, this is the tricky part. And a, a pod models, uh, a logic host, so everything you need to run an instance of an application. For example, if you have an app that serves a file uh, consisting of a container that does the serving and a container that fetches the file and does some more processing, those two are tightly cobbled container would run as a pod. They will share storage, they can talk over local host because they're part of the same pod, and they're guaranteed to run on the same physical node. So most pods, however, will consist of a single container. And the thing that is super important to know is that they are ephemeral. And this is the benefit and the tricky part with Kubernetes is that when they die, uh, Kubernetes will just fire up new pods and new pods will be started. So just to reiterate and be sure, I know it's tricky, but you do not run containers on Kubernetes, you run pods. So this is the difference. So now what I want to do, you know, I connected, I put the context of my Kubernetes cluster. So I, I quote unquote connected to my Kubernetes cluster from my computer. Now I can interact with it. What I want to do, I want to deploy the same Flask application on Kubernetes. So I will deploy a pod. In the left side, uh, the definition, the manifest file are done in YAML. You can use JSON also, but I've never used them. Uh, I never use it, even if I love JSON. So if you look at the definition of my manifest file, I'm mentioning the API version. I'm saying now I want to deploy a, po deploy a pod. I had some metadata name labels uh, that will be useful in the future. So I won't cover those right now. And the important part, the most important part that you need to understand is I will define my container right now, which by giving it the name called Flask, I will use an image. So what I've done is that the container that I created before that you've seen run on Docker, the example that I just did before, we deployed this on Docker Hub, and now I can just use it as an image for my pod. So I don't have to manage the, the container myself. I use just the, uh, the container on Docker Hub as my image for my pod. So if I go back in the command line at that point, what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to go to my Kubernetes folder here. If I list the content, I have three files. Just focus on the first one. So I'm going to do kubectl apply.fflask. Uh, this one is pod. So now what I'm doing, and I'm deploying the flask pod. So the five you've seen, this is the same five you've seen. I deployed it. So now if I look at the pod, if I list, oh, actually it's get pod. If I list the pod, not pod, but uh, you're gonna see now that tada, there is the flask pod out there. It has been deployed. So if I want to test it again, now there's the tricky part. And I will show you a better way to do that after, but I need to forward the port uh, like I did for my container. So I will say, okay, now forward port 5,000 to port 5,000. 
on my container. So I'm going to run this. Now it's forwarding. If I go back here and I do curl again, and remember I close Docker, so Docker is not running anymore. If I do curl, it's not working because I put one zero too much. And I do that again, and now it's working. It's 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 real hard to try to do a hell world, but please bear with me. <laughs> so now it's working. I can do a curl. It's working. And for the sake of that demo, what I will do, I will delete that pod right now. Uh, delete pod, and it's called Flask pod. So I will delete the pod. Uh, it takes some time, and uh, oh, that was pretty fast this time. So let's go back to my presentation. So what I've done right now, really fast, is that I deployed my application using a pod on my Kubernetes cluster by using my Docker image that I published on Docker Hub. I wouldn't have to deploy this on Docker Hub. I would have been able to uh, do it in other fashion, but right now I think it's the best practice to do that. But what about if I want to manage multiple pods? Uh, there is something, a workload type, uh, called deployments that will help me to do that. So I would be able, actually, let me roll back. I would be able to do this with repli replica sets, uh, which is an option I would be able to ensure that a given number of pod replicas run at any point in time. Example, I could say I will, I want two, and Kubernetes will always be sure that there is always two pod running of uh, the pod that I deployed. But what I want to do, a better practice, because we usually uh, don't want to use replica set directly, we're going to use deployment as the main workload type uh, used to run the stateless application. So it gave us a higher level of abstraction that has feature like rollout strategies and declarative updates to pods and many, many options. So it's just easier to deploy, to scale, and to update, and able to roll back to a given release. So if I go back to my example, because we love publishing a world Python application in the cloud. So now what I'm doing, instead of publishing a pod, I'm publishing uh, what I call a deployment. So if you look at my file, the kind is deployment. I still have my metadata name and labels. What I'm going to say here is that I want two pods. I want two replicas of that pod. But instead of defining them, uh, each of them, I will use what we call a template. So I will say, okay, two replicas of the app called Flash L World. Oops, sorry, Flash L World. And the magic happened in the template here. So in the template, again, I have some beta data. Actually, labels take those more as tags. Uh, they're not unique, so it's it's it, you can use them to group and to access multiple resources that have the same goal at the same time or that are about the same application. And where the magic happened with the template is that I'm going to have containers here. Again, a little bit of the same syntax as before. The name is Flask. The image that I'm going to use is the same that I was that I used before, and I'm still opening a port. So if I go to my command line and I run this. So again, I'm gonna do kubectl, which is probably the common line uh, tool I'm using the more these days. I'm gonna do flask, and this file is called deployment. So I'm gonna deploy my deployment. Is it nice? <laughs> I'm gonna do kubectl uh, now. I want to see like if it was deployed, if there is any deployment. So yes, it's there. Uh, there's only one and two ready, so it's deploying the rest. But now if I do kubectl get pods, both should have been deployed. So now I have two pods running and I was able to do that by using a manifest file and not having to deploy them separately. So it's kind of like a best practices. And now again, if I want to be sure, if I want you to trust me, I will show you port forward deployment, uh, which is called Flask, uh, I call it Flask Dep. Again, 5,000, 50,000. I will do the same thing, nope. Uh, do, 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 do. Is it 5,000? 5,000. Did I miss something with the port? Uh, KubeCL, port forward, deployment, flask. The, uh, oh, I put a slash instead and slash instead of two point. So now I'm doing the same thing. Again, I deleted the pod that I uh, deployed before. So if I do kill again, LOL, this is magic. This is awesome. So now let me. Kill that one. Oh, switch that. Let me uh, stop the port forwarding. Again, you're telling me, Fred, like, should I have to do port forwarding all the time? 
the thing is that you now there is uh, services called that uh, there's services that will help you to expose your application to the outside world. And I know I'm talking a lot, so I want to be respectful of the time. So there's different type of services. There's cluster IP, and I will show you how it's working. It's basically uh, creating an internal IP address that pods can use to reach the service. There's also not port. Uh, it's another type of service that expose the service on each node's IP at a static port, uh, which is why it's called node port. And uh, think externally when you think about node port. And load balancer, which is probably what you want to achieve most of the time, and this is what I'm gonna show you. It's to create an external, uh, usually that's gonna use the cloud provider load balancer. So you're gonna create an external load balancer, a way for people to reach out to your application so you don't have to do yourself the port forwarding, but you don't also have to do the routing and the load balancing by yourself. So load balancer will route routes the request to node port and cluster IP services. There's also another things you can do. Um, you can use something called ingress controllers because every time you're going to create a load balancer service, it will spin up a load balancer for each service. So uh, that's ingress controller is going to help you to have more flexibility route traffic into your cluster, more flexibility to route traffic uh, into your cluster. But I won't touch base about ingress because that's that's a different story. So right now, if I'm focusing on a node port, what's going to happen is that I have those node port uh, that are creating cluster IP. When there is external traffic that it's the cluster nodes at their public IP addresses and the node port, those will get routed to the cluster IP. So if I access the IP 222.233.233.133, that is an amazing IP, uh, at that port, that will uh, go knock at the door to the cluster IP, my prod service here. And that will load balance and get routed to the deployment pod. So what you want to do is probably the next step, you probably want to have a load balancer, which I take the same graphic, but once again, um, this time, but this time, sorry, the traffic will hit the cloud load balancer at an external IP, which is like the 222.121 like that you can see. So Sammy the shark is her user is accessing the load balancer. The load balancer will uh, connect, uh, actually the cloud load balancer ultimately configured to route the traffic to the cluster nodes at their nord, node ports. And at their turn, uh, as I shown you before, the traffic then will follow the same flow as the previous slide. So the node port will go to the cluster IP and the cluster IP will load balance to the deployment port. So how do you want to do that? It's another YAML file, it's a service manifest. If you look at the fight to the right, where like the big thing to remember is that you need to change the kind. So kind is services, still having metadata here that's gonna be useful if you want to do more advanced stuff. Now I'm have specifications. So I want the specification of my service is load balancer. And I want to open the external port 80 and target the port 5000 using TCP. And again, I do this for my Flask LOL application. So if I go in a command line and I do this uh, quickly, I'm going to deploy this. So I'm going to do cube CTL. Again, I'm going to apply my file is Flask services. So I'm applying my service to my cluster. Now I can see that if I do SVC, you're gonna see that now I have a service called Flask SVC, which is the one I just uh, I just did. So it takes a little bit of time because uh, the provider needs to fire, need to uh, create the load balancer. So uh, you're gonna be able to either see the IP here or uh, you're gonna be able to see the IP also if I exit the full screen here and I go back here, I'm gonna go in networking and I'm gonna go in load balancer and my load balancer is creating right now. And once that's gonna be created, I'm gonna have an external IP address that I'm gonna be able to, ac to use to access my application. And it's usually quite fast uh, right now because I'm presenting to you, it's taking just a little more time than in used to. Uh, so I will move to the next slide for the sake of time. Oh, actually it's done now, yeah. Got it. So if I use that, even in my browser, I don't have to use curl. Uh, I just use curl for the sake of the demo. But like if I go there, I'm going to have L world. So all the things I've shown you in the previous slide was uh, working in my application. So now I have a services that point to the node port, uh, the load balancer, that point to the node port, that load balance to the cluster IP, and uh, actually that goes to the cluster IP and load balance to my different pods, my different nodes. So this is how it's working. 
this is where the magic happened. This is where you don't have to do uh, what I've done during all that time and uh, showing you how to do port forwarding. Obviously, I didn't talk about storage. Uh, keep in mind that there is a way for you. There is volumes that you can use. The only thing with volumes is that uh, the thing is that they are, uh, when the pod ceases to exist, the volume will cease to exist too. So there is persistent volume that you can use, and it's uh, you know it's an abstraction uh, data level operators to separate storage provisioning from consumption. So what you can do that will do use in our case the DO block storage, and uh, think about those are as like volume plugging for volume like uh, they have a life cycle independent on any individual pod that use the PV the persistent volume. So it's a way for you to preserve the data through restarting. And how you do that, in our case, you use the persistent volume claim, but I won't go too deep in that uh, because this is probably one of the next steps that you want to learn about Kubernetes. Obviously, that was a super fast uh, like overview of Kubernetes. Again, the goal was to give you at least the minimal knowledge to want to get a little bit deeper and trying it to yourself and see that it may seem complicated because this is the first thing that people tell me, like, I don't use Kubernetes, it seems too complicated. So you've seen that, yeah, it can be because I've, I've given you a lot of knowledge about Kubernetes, but you've seen that when I was knowing what I was doing with the pod and the services, it was quite easy for me to deploy application in the cloud in my Kubernetes cluster. But obviously there is a lot more. There is like way for you to do uh, resources request and limit, auto scaling. Uh, there is things called node affinity, tense interrelation. Uh, there's also a dashboard. You can see some, uh, some minimal information about your cluster. There's metric server. Uh, there is a lot more you can do with Kubernetes, and there is a lot more out there. So obviously, as I said, we will share those information, those resources with you by email after uh, the webinar. As a reminder, we recorded the webinar, so we're going to have the video also. And for those of you that would like to either start with, like either maybe watching the video again and trying to do what I've done, or just watching it and like keeping it a little bit slower to understand every other part, please feel free to do it. Also, we have a uh, meetup kit, which is uh, how I base my presentation. It's on the meetup kit, it's a shorter version, but we also have in that meetup kit, step-by-step -step how to do what I've done today as a workshop. Uh, we also have the slides available there and obviously uh, there's the GitHub repository and the uh, Docker image that we pushed on the uh, repo. And many, many resources. We also have a really good tutorials from A to Z for full stack developers that want to learn Kubernetes. I highly suggest you to do that. If you're using DO tutorials, you know that we are uh, we have amazing tutorials and this is one, probably one of the most amazing from my own point of view. So we're close to the one hour, maybe a little bit uh, after. I know I love to talk. I want to thank you for your time. Really, uh, I appreciate it. I hope uh, you enjoy it. I hope you learn something. I hope you're just excited enough to try it. And as I said, we're going to send you some credits to use uh, DigitalOcean and try Kubernetes as a service offer we have for your new customers and also stay tuned so this is the first webinar of 2020 but we expect to run one about terraform uh, my colleague mason will uh give a webinar on terraform and i'm a huge fan of terraform so that should be amazing and this is before the end of the month so again thanks for your time uh, especially thanks for people where it's super late where you live and um, i think that's it for today so at that point, Ryan, you are the one, you will tell me what we do now. Do we have time to take questions? Are we following up with people by email? What are we doing? Um, honestly, I, I think we're kind of at time and uh, I'm sure if we were to you know, try taking live questions, I, I'm not even sure how we would sort that at, at this moment. Um, so with that, I'm just going to say thank you to everybody who joined today. I, I hope that uh, this was very helpful to you. Um, stay tuned uh, to your email for uh, some, some things coming your way so you can hopefully get started using DigitalOcean Kubernetes and some of the other services on our platform. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll just say thank you again.